from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm hearing crickets. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. That is so much better. Thank you for being here this afternoon for the second day of the National Book Festival. And boy, are you in for a treat. One, because it's not raining right now, which is a very good thing. And second, because you're going to meet two incredible people. But first, a bit of a housekeeping note for you. This event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's website and other media. You are encouraged to offer your comments and raise your hand uh, during the formal question and answer period, but please be advised that your voice and your image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. And by participating in this question and answer period, you are giving your consent. Basically, if you're in here, we can use your face, we can use your voice, and you can't say a thing about it. Got it? All right. I'm Leslie Foster, and I anchor the evening shows at WUSA 9, and I have a love for reading and writing, so it's fantastic to be here with you and introduce our author and illustrator. Lisa Klein Ransom grew up in Boston, and she knew she wanted to be a writer from the time she was in middle school. She had a love of books and writing early, thanks to her mom, who took her to the library quite often. She loved her diary. How many of you guys out here have a diary? How many kids out here have a diary? Ah, there may be some stories brewing in those diaries. That's where some of Lisa's stories first started. And Lisa met her partner in life, her husband, who also happens to be the illustrator she works with every day as well. They're a fantastic writing and illustrating team, Lisa and James Ransom. So without any further ado, Lisa and James Ransom. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Hey, just a little um, warning. Um, this is my first time using my tablet to present. So if at any point there's just a blank stare, it's because something has gone horribly wrong and I don't know how to fix it. So just bear with me. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you. Um, we're going to talk about our newest book, um, Light in the Darkness. And one, one small correction. There, is, there are more books at the book tent. So they said they found another box of books. So if everyone wants to rush over, after we speak to get the books, they're there. So what was it, the last copy? Okay, I'm gonna start, and uh, James and I are used to working together, so I'll talk a little bit, and he'll talk a little bit, and we'll see what happens. You'll see how much I talk. <laughs> Not a lot. Yeah, that's really funny, that's really funny. So, um, <laughs> I've always been fascinated by people's stories. Um, their histories really interest me. Uh, one of the reasons I write picture book biographies is simply because I'm nosy. I love asking questions. I eavesdrop on strangers' conversations. I interrogate friends and family. I was the kid in class who always raised my hand asking questions. I love asking questions of people. And that's what writing allows me to do. It allows me to just ask questions of people. I grew up with a mother who really loved to read. She worked night shift um, as a nurse, but during the days, um, she loved to spend her time reading. And the two of us often made trips to the library. Um, we would stack up on books, and we'd head home, and we'd have our books for the week. And through that love of reading, my mother really um, taught me that, that reading is a real escape. And I have always really appreciated love. My, I have always had a love of the written word. Um, through books, I met the characters of Judy Bloom. I long to live a life like Laura Ingalls Wilder. And through books, I learned about strength and fortitude. And it just gave me, um, it gave me, um, it just kind of inspired me to be stronger and to fight for, for, for what I believe. I, I feel like it made me into um, a woman, a strong woman. <clears throat> I often complain about the research part of writing. Research is always a little tricky for me. It's something that sometimes it's a little, um, sometimes it's drudge work, 
Um, but for the most part, the research allows me to be kind of act, like, act as kind of an investigative journalist. I get to sniff out stories, get to the heart of a person or a character, and it allows me to kind of uncover the portions of a person's life that make them the most interesting. In my, my early life was probably just the opposite of Lisa's. I grew up in a um, household with my um, a teenage mother and my grandmother in probably one of the poorest regions in North Carolina, a small, in Northampton County, in a town called Rich Square. Um, <clears throat> we bounced back and forth between New Jersey and North Carolina as I was, when I was a very young kid. And eventually my, uh, I, my grandmother sort of took me under her wings and raised me with her and my mother um, lived in, um, in New Jersey. But those, those summers with my grandmother, we would go around to my uncles and aunts' homes. They lived all up the East Coast. So I would spend a summer in Baltimore, um, or maybe in Newark, New Jersey, or in Patterson, New Jersey. And that really gave me a sense of family and connecting to all, all my cousins. So I'm the one person in the family who has a connection with all my, almost all my cousins, unlike some who've never met or rarely have had time with other ones. So all those things you've seen in my books, from books like Aunt Flossie's Hats and Crab Cakes Later to um, Satchel Page, um, stories about Major Taylor, all those connections come out through my stories that, from my traveling to different parts of the, of, of the country. So I also feel very comfortable living in the country as well as the city. And um, those are things that um, got me interested in, in drawing. It was actually with my cousin who, um, who was who's deaf and mute, who would, when I went to um, Brooklyn as a little kid, he introduced me to my first comic book store. And there was all these comic books. I left with a handful of um, Sergeant Rock, Archie comics, and um, the Rawhide Kid. And I couldn't wait to get back home and draw those comics. And that's basically how I started drawing. Copying comic books, um, being in my small home in the rural south, um, I would lock myself in for the weekends and I would just draw and make sto write stories and stay them together. I would share those with my friends in school the following um, school week. So that's how I, I started drawing. Okay. Writers are often told to write about what they know and to write about what they love. And I know this, and I love reading. I mean, reading is truly my love. So this year, my goal has been, this is really kind of prompted by an argument I had with my teenage son about his not reading, and I was kind of bragging about how much I read so much, I'm kind of competitive. So I'm always kind of, I was bragging about how much I read and you're not reading enough, and it went back and forth, and anyhow, I made a pledge to him that I could read a book of week um, for the rest of the year. Um, he really didn't care, uh, as long as I wasn't forcing him to read a book a week, but the point, <laughs> just now I'm trapped into this whole thing where I'm reading a book a week. Um, I read magazines, I read um, newspapers, boxes. I read cereal boxes. So Everything. being here at the National Book Festival is really, to me, my idea of a dream vacation. This is just wonderful. Um, so in writing about what I love, um, that's how I came to the story of Light in the Darkness. It actually started when I was working on the book um, Words Set Me Free, the, the biography of Frederick Douglass, and how um, he used uh, learning to read as a means of escape. Um, I was doing some research and this came up just this very small passage about pit schools, which were holes dug in the ground by slaves um, who would sneak out of their cabins at night and they would all meet in this pit in the ground and learn to read from another slave. Uh, they were often risking um, life and limb in order to do that, but they knew that literacy, they valued literacy, they valued uh, the power of education um, despite the fact that their lives were at risk. Um, but they took this risk, and they felt that the risk was worth it. And that was um, a theme that I really wanted to celebrate. And so I'm gonna read you a little bit from um, Light in the Darkness. One night last week when the lantern was out and the cabin was cool, Mama told me about a place we could go to learn letters. Like the letters Morris reads to us from the Bible on Sunday, I asked her. Just like those, Mama said. Mama says down the road a bit at the Pompey Plantation, the master's wife taught Morris to read the Bible when he was young. Guess she never figured he'd take that learning and make a school. She says one day when we're free, 
we're going to need those letters. But for now, we have to act like reading is the last thing we want to do. Master once whipped a slave girl who learned to read. We all had to watch him give her a lash for every letter she learned. Mama stepped in front of me so I couldn't see, but I could still hear the whip. Tonight we walk till my legs feel like we can't walk anymore. Mama stops and whispers, here. She calls out like a bird and then the bushes in front of us move to the side. We step forward and look down into a big hole in the ground. In the light of a lantern, I see faces, young and old, looking up at us, as many as the fingers on my hands. Some of the faces I know, and some I don't. Arms reach up to help us down, first me, then mama. We squeeze into the center of a pit, barely big enough for us to stand in. Branches move back into place, making a roof that pricks our hair. It's cool inside, damp dirt, Damp dirt and the smell of pine needles cling to everyone. Someone holds the lantern and all I can see is a pile of sticks. At least that's what they look like to me. Morris says soon they're gonna look like letters and those letters will spell out words. He takes some sticks and make a shape, makes a shape that looks like a hat. Says it's called an A. He makes two noises and says, those are the sounds A makes. <clears throat> Being a mother to four has helped me to define the types of stories that I want to write. Um, when the kids were young, James and I would read to them at night. And we always wanted to be able to share our history in a way that engaged them and taught them and taught them something about themselves. I remembered many of the biographies of my own youth and they were kind of stories of perfect people with perfect lives and perfect families. And I wasn't any of that. I wasn't perfect in any way. I, you know, sometimes I, I wasn't that great in school and my life was just in no way perfect. So I often wondered how a young girl from Malden, Massachusetts would make her way in the world. And then I read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings and To Kill a Mockingbird and The Color Purple. And those books taught me that people can rise above their circumstances. And I think that's part of the reason why I tend to write about characters and books about that feature people who um, are faced with adversity and tend to rise above it. Um, in our book Satchel Page, Satchel, uh, I like you know, I like uh, uh, demonstrating for kids that, you know, you don't always have to um, walk a straight path and that sometimes your life takes many different diversions, but you can still wind up in a very great place. You can still go on to do amazing things. In our book, Satchel Page, um, he spent time in reform school, but it prepared him for the Negro Leagues. And Major Taylor Champion Cyclist, he was the object of hostile racism, but it motivated him um, in a way that um, other circumstances may not have. Um, in Pele, his father's dreams drove him to elevate the field of soccer. And in this book, Light in the Darkness, the story of Rosa, um, a young slave girl who yearns for knowledge despite her circumstances. So I'm gonna talk to you guys about how, I have two mics on, that's why that happened. How we met. Um, I, was, um, I was a student at Pratt Institute, and Lisa was there as well. She was studying fashion merchandising. I was studying illustration, and we actually met at a Purple Rain party. I asked her to dance, and we've been dancing ever since. Um, Most days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> at the time, she was interested in writing for magazines, um, and I, was, I started illustrating children's books, and she went back to school and um, got her, well, she actually started working for Lord and Taylor's and then Macy's as a copywriter. And at some point you decide you want to go back to school and get your master's in education. Um, and, um, so after graduating uh, from, from your graduate program, you want to, I feel like I'm telling your story. I feel like, you, <laughs> <laughs> so she graduated a master's program. Um, she was pregnant with our first daughter. So she stayed at home. And as she's home with the children, I'm illustrating, she became more and more interested in writing for children, and that's how we started working together. Now, our process is um, very simple. We really don't work together when you, when, we, when you look at it truly. I think that's the magic of it. Um, I think that that's what makes it work. <laughs> because um, Lisa will, I, I am usually the idea person. Um, I usually will pitch at Lisa, you know, 10 ideas, 20 ideas, and she'll take one of those ideas. Now, all the books that I've written have been things that Lisa has turned down. So I pitch them to her, she goes, no. I go, well, 
I'm going to write this story myself. And so um, she'll pick one of those ideas, and she will work on it. And she will read to me what she's working on um, as, she, as it's developing. So I hear different parts of it. So I get to sort of um, do research before I start working on the book. I get to sort of, if I see a book on the subject, I'll maybe I'll put that aside. I'll make sketches or have ideas. And those things are so all sort of put aside until the story is completely finished because the stories go through so many different changes. So once Lisa finished writing the story, it goes on my schedule. And it's probably about a year or two years before I can get to the book. At that point, Lisa has probably written two or three other books and can't really remember this book that she wrote three years ago at all. So when I'm working on the book, she's not really that involved because I'm making the pictures, I'm doing additional research, I'm discovering things. What's great about it is the fact that because of those books I pulled aside when she was writing, it helps me get, go through my research part easier. And plus, I know exactly what she's been looking at. And that's also helped me, especially if we have to go on a traveling trip to, uh, to gather research. So um, I illustrate the books, and then it comes out about a year later. Yeah, but exactly. um, yeah. she comes in from time to time. And the more we do these types of um, conferences and talk about our process, the more she gets involved. Five years ago, she was not involved at all. Okay, that's not true. Now, that's she comes true. in and she says, well, let me look at that, just so I can say okay. I looked at it. Just so I can so I she, come to the National Book Festival <laughs> and tell you guys that I actually looked at the, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you so, choose. <laughs> believe what you want. Yeah. So, <laughs> I do enjoy looking at some of the work, and I do have input. Um, but okay, there, there was. Usually, our no, lives are so crazy. No, that's true. I mean, there, there between was a the point, four kids yes, yes. and everything is going on, you know, she comes into the studio and it's like, you know, we're just this, 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 yeah. this. I got to go. Yeah, and, you're running to yeah. a store, you got to yeah. take someone. I can't really sit right now and talk about how wonderful the cover is for the newest book. Like, I can't take that time. So, yeah. you know, I, I give feedback here and there. James gives, likes to give a lot of feedback on the writing, which I actually ignore. So, I mean, he, you know, there is some, there is back and forth on that. I admit I'm a wannabe writer, but, yeah. uh, but that's, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I have, sometimes, I have I make, sometimes I make some good suggestions. Sometimes you sometimes. do. Yeah, sometimes you do. Okay, and so we'll finish up this sideshow with a little, <laughs> <laughs> always goes off into this other realm. So, um, I just want to reach, I want to read to you the, the final passage of um, Light in the Darkness, and then we have some time for questions. Uh, days pass, no, I will, I will just, okay. Um, be, uh, before I read this final passage, um, one of the uh, things in the book that's highlighted is the, the level of danger that both the mother and Rosa face. Um, and they've already been um, nearly discovered by patrollers who are out at night. And so time passes and it's not safe enough to go back to the school. So now we're at that point. Um, days pass and still no school. I've learned all my letters and I'm ready to make words. Morris told me after the letters comes the reading and writing. Finally, one night I can't wait any longer. I shake mama. Not tonight, Rosa, it's still not safe. I shake her again and don't stop until I feel her get up from the pallet. We leave for school under a speck of moonlight. Morris is alone, only me and mama came to school tonight. Might as well get started, Morris says, and reaches for the stick. Rosa, I got a word just for you. He writes four letters in the dirt, and I move closer to see. R, O, we hear them again. Footsteps this time, soft light, but sure. Like they know just where we are. Whispers and more steps. I look up at Mama, but she just stares at the roof. Master will whip us all and Morris the most for teaching us. A lash for each letter. And then there's another sound, like the soft call of a bird. Morris reaches up to pull apart the branches. I raise the lantern to see who found us. I see faces looking down at us. Some I know and some I don't, but everyone waiting to step in, into school. A girl, newer and bigger than me, stands in the corner of the pit. Here, I say, picking up a stick. I'll show you how I write my name. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Any questions now? Any questions? So now we have time for questions. Hi. 
Hi, how are you? Oh, very good. Uh, I read that, uh, Lisa, you were very um, shy, you know, at, uh, when, and couldn't really stand up in public and, <laughs> and speak. Have you gotten over that fear, or how did you overcome that fear? She's not shy. Well, I think <laughs> Who wrote that? I think, actually, I think the question was for me. I yes, thought, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> I thought the question. Okay, so, um, uh, it's interesting. I, I did grow up very shy. I was the youngest of three, and I had a very, very outgoing father who, when we went to family functions, would actually get angry that I wasn't speaking up enough. And on the way home, sometimes he would yell, you have to talk, you have to speak up, and it would drive me insane. I realized as I got older that the people who spoke up seem to be the people who um, got more, got more attention from teachers, uh, got better assignments. And um, I came to my father one day and I said, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to speak up. And my father actually gave me tips on how to go to a party and how to find ways to talk to people and to try to find common interests and to look people in the eye. And I worked at it. And um, I sometimes feel that my interest in people and interest in their stories help me to overcome my shyness because I love asking questions and I love meeting people. James laughs because by the time I met James, I wasn't shy and he's, I feel like since we, the day we've met, I've never stopped talking. So he doesn't understand that portion of my life, but it, it came with some work. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, hi. Hi. My name is and I got a question to you by a word a book. You say you're going with time? Uh, well, I think a word in my book. You want to tell her that you like the way she likes the word? A word. She, she, wants to tell, she wants to tell you that she likes the way you write the words in the book. Oh, thank yeah, you yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that yeah. means a lot. Because sometimes when you're writing, you're just in a room by yourself and you don't get a chance to interact with people. So it means a lot to hear that the, that the words are, are meaningful to you. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> at what stage, oh, this, oh, I'm sorry. At what stage in your creation process are you pitching your idea to your editor and are you published by the same publisher for all of your books? Um, we're not, I, I work with several different publishers, but the, the, um, it's, been a, it's been a long process for me because um, I've been at several different places and I've always been kind of looking for an editor that I really connect with and that really understands my work. And I was really lucky in that the editor who published my first book, Satchel Page, um, it was, she was such a great editor and she left shortly after that book was published and I tried, bounced around. And then the, we met up again and we reconnected. I had this idea for this story, Pit Schools. And she said, let's just try it. And so we're together again. So I feel like it's like a reunion. So we've come back together again. And she's my editor at Disney. Um, but we, work for, we do work for other publishers. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like when the, uh, you were pitching the idea, usually I like to get an idea really fleshed out. In fact, I prefer to write the story first. I tend to not pitch ideas per se because I don't think that people can really get a full understanding of how I'm going to tell. If I say I want to write a story about Louis Armstrong, you don't know how I'm going to tell that story, and so as a result, you may not be that interested. So I, I wait till it's finished. Um, I would say that we, um, the next book that I'm working on is a follow-up for this book. This is doing a series about reading in African Americans, and this one takes place um, in the 1870s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, about a, a school being built. So that's what I'm working on sort of now. Um, but um, yeah, Lisa usually writes the entire story and then we, we show it to the publisher and then they make comments, they edit, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Are you always together? No, we're not. No, we are, we are not. <laughs> um, I just, there was, I have a neighbor, uh, actually, we live we in the same town. I've always loved his work. His name is Brian Karras. Yeah. Um, he's a great illustrator. And we are working on our first book together. I, I pitched it to him at like Stop and Shop. Um, I saw him, Brian. And so he, you know, he, we're doing a book um, about a girl on a whale watching expedition. Yeah. We're really um, fortunate. We live in a town where there's a number of illustrators um, James Gurney, Dinotopia, um, Peter McCarty of um, Hondo and Fabian, um, and Brian Karras. Um, but I do books with other, other writers. 
Um, Jacqueline Woodson and I have a book that just came out this fall. Um, this is The Rope. And Lisa has done one book with an, um, an illustrator, but other books also will be with different illustrators. Um, I, I can't illustrate fast enough for the writing. That's so. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hello, this may be a general question for all authors, but it may be different for every author, but what gives you the ideas to create the characters for your novels or books? Uh, writing for me is so um, organic. It, almost always I, I, I start with a certain plan in mind, like this is how I'm going to write it, and the more I read or the more I get to know the character, it takes a different shape and form. So. Um, I guess it's, you know, it's hard, because it, it just kind of takes a life of its own. Um, I get ideas from everywhere. I think um, one of the places I really love to generate, get ideas generating is uh, the obituary pages. I, I really love reading about people's lives, and, and again, James is, gives me a lot of ideas, and the more I, you know, one of the, the, one of the, the best parts about reading is that you, it does generate a lot of ideas. So for me, that's, that's some of the ways in which I, I get ideas. How about you? Um, I usually have sort of a, a motivator, you know, something that's motivating me, and I, and I sort of write for that, and I do research for that. Um, we both love history, so yeah, you know, yeah. we tend to look for historical stories. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for your outstanding work. Thank you. You're welcome. My question, when you um, penned your first book, your very first book, and illustrated your very first book, did you already have an agent? Did you look for an agent afterwards? Or, or did you just query a publisher? Did you ever think about self-publishing? So I guess that's three questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I started publishing. Um, this is how I, I got my first book. I did not have an agent. I was um, a year and a half out of art school. I was showing, uh, I went to a, the Graphic Artists Guild used to have a portfolio party where illustrators would come together and network. They would share their portfolios with each other. And this was in New York City, and I, I lived in Jersey City at the time, and um, I came to this party, and a young man just happened to bump into a friend of his who he went to school with, and he decided to come to this party also. At this party, he saw my portfolio, and he said, you should send your work to this book publishing company. And I did. And I, so I, I set an appointment to go see this guy named Richard Jackson, who owned Orchard, who was an editor at Orchard Books. And I had, to, I had to make a late appointment because I was dropping off the artwork for another project. And I showed up around 6 o'clock. He waited for me. Um, he flipped through my portfolio. And he said, here is a manuscript. I'd like you to read this and tell me if you'd like to illustrate it. So I had no agent. Uh, I, was, I knew very little bit about the business, and that's how I did my first book. And I worked for a very long time with no agent. Um, so you don't really need an agent. I don't have an agent now. I've had agents, and now I'm, I'm agentless. And um, I think, and Lisa is also. Yes, my first book, I had no agent. Um, and then by my second or third book, I, um, I signed on with James, the agent James was using. And then Nat, for the last couple of books I, I've gone without an agent. I'm considering getting an agent again, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about self-publishing um, because one of the good things that publishing companies do is that they do have, sometimes they have some marketing money um, and I personally feel like as a writer, I really need an editor. I really do need someone to kind of work through a plot with me and characters and I do think it makes a better story. So I am more comfortable with an editor. Also, my understanding is that many bookstores don't carry self-published books so that could also be an issue. And I, yeah. I don't have the, I'm not in the position to, to, to hand sell that many books or take them around with me. I can't do it. I would suggest SCVWI if you're interested in writing. Okay. And to join that organization. It's a wonderful organization that can really help you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I have a question uh, for you as parents and as writer and illustrator. Um, as Jews, there comes a moment when we have to explain to our children about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Sure. And for yourselves, when do you come to, this, to the moment when you have to explain to your children and also professionally when you explain about slavery? It's, Go. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do. I think children's books is a way of helping, is maybe being introduced um, in a softer way, but it's a very difficult 
um, conversation to have. And you're right. Um, you do have to have the conversation. Um, I don't know when's the right time. I guess it depends on the child, the household. Um, but I think children's books are a good way to sort of nicely and gently introduce it and, and bring up the, the conversation. And, and movies also, you know. Um, I, uh, someone once told me that they took one of my early books, Sweet Clara and the Freedom Quilt, and the, you no, know, it was The Wagon, which, you know, I've done a number of books about slavery, and, and usually I, I get to this point, this crossroads. Am I gonna do harsh, or am I gonna pull back and do a light version? And I've gone back and forth, and I can, have the, I can debate either way, which is the right way to go, the wrong way to go. So this person told me they introduced my book, Wagon, which I thought was one of the harsher versions, because I just finished doing Sweet Clara, which was a very soft version. And she was upset that these first graders knew nothing about it. And I was really surprised that she was surprised that these first graders didn't know much about slavery because they were first graders. And I really questioned the fact that she was actually using the wagon to introduce slavery to them, where she maybe should have used something like Sweet Clara or something else, a little softer. So, you know, it's a difficult conversation, but it's those, we have to have those. I've always felt that, and you know, it's part of our history, and it, and it may be a difficult part of our history, but we have to, oh, I see the overture. Oh, no, I was sure I would, okay. But we have to, we have, to have the discussion. Um, what I found is that kids kind of lead the way on that, and that often I would be saying, oh, I just got this great book, and I want to share this with you, it's a book about slavery. And uh, so my, my youngest daughter used to say, please, no more about slavery. Like, we know enough about slavery enough. So I have to sometimes pull back. Um, and let them lead the way and how much they can take and how much more they want to hear. Okay. okay. Thank We're, you so thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.